Yeah. Could you tell us first of all um, how you became involved with the LGBT yeah. community in Uganda? Well, it came like this. I uh, started a counseling in 1998. But in 2001, some young, disturbed LGBT people were introduced to me. They were being rejected by the church. Some had been sent away from school. They were really disturbed and uh, felt they were no good. Even the church couldn't help them because they were saying they should change. If they didn't change, they would convert to something else. Being, home, uh, being heterosexuals, they were gone case. So they were so uh, dejected, they were so unhappy. So I started talking to them, sharing with them, and uh, that's how I started actually to be involved, because I knew about human sexuality. So instead of rejecting them, I listened to them. What was the reaction of your, um, your brothers in the Anglican community? In fact, that was the beginning of uh, also myself being rejected, because as I had already retired as a bishop, diocesan bishop, but I was working with my fellow bishops as a retired person. When you're a bishop and you retire, you continue to work. You have seen even when I come here, I'm bishop. When you are allowed, you are given something to do, you do it. But those bishops said, now, unless you condemn those people, you are no longer going to work with us. So that was the beginning of my suffering. But I, I didn't agree with them on that I should stop raping these people when they came to me. That is what has gone on even to this day. Could you say something about the anti-homosexuality bill and how it came about? Well, the anti-homosexual bill came about because there were people who wanted to preach a gospel which was saying that unless you change, according to what they were saying and uh, in the Bible, for instance, uh, these stories about the Bible, the Bible says that uh, Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed because of LGBT people. And then people came and started preaching such a gospel. And uh, because many of our people are very religious, they listened to them. There was no way of trying to ex uh, help them see that this thing, the passage which talks about, for instance, Sodom and Gomorrah, is, de is dealing mostly with a lack of hospitality and uh, the misbehavior of the people, is sexually like rape and all that sort of thing, and not caring about the poor. That is what it is really about. But uh, nobody would like to listen to that. So. They said now the family would be eroded because if people were LGBT, they couldn't have children. So they made things that aroused the feelings of the people. And some of these people came from actually the states of America, United States of America. So a sexual orientation then is, can be anything. You know, you, it could be homosexual, it can be heterosexual, it can be toward children, it can be toward animals, it can be toward shoes, it can be toward, there's all kinds of different things. And actually, the, the Di Diagnostic and Statistical Manual that the psychologists and the psychiatrists use has a list of 26 or so different sexual orientations that you can have. But when the gay movement uses the term sexual orientation, they don't, they never define it. You never see in any of the laws, anywhere that this is used, you never see the term sexual orientation defined. Or if you do see it defined, they define it as heterosexuality and homosexuality. Right? Or maybe they'll put another one in there. Because they want to be able to have the, the broadness and of ambiguity of the term to be able to, so broad enough to allow homosexuality in as equal with, with uh, I mean, homosexuality is equal with heterosexuality. 
but they don't want people to, to think of it so broadly that would bring in other things that people don't like, like pedophilia, right? Because if you actually accept the term sexual orientation for what it really means, and you say that you can't discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation, then that would mean that you can't discriminate on the basis of pedophilia. It means you can't stop someone from molesting children, or that you can't stop them from having sex with animals. Right? So that's why they never put the definition in. Or if they do, they only put it and they say, this is limited to heterosexuality and homosexuality. And uh, one, in one conference, I saw them talking about this. And in fact, there's a, a documentary called The Missionaries of Hate. It has been online. If you see it, you'll see some of these people in that documentary. Even supporting the bill saying, Oh, well, they would not have probably written it in the way it was written, but they think it is right to have such a bill in, in Uganda. So this is how things have developed. And they have met some members of parliament, trying to influence them. In fact, after that conference, which was in March last year, the bill again was drafted away, was uh, sort of came to the surface in October. And... Uh, there's this kind of instigation from outside uh, against LGBT. Uh, one of them really said, at home, we are not really listened to, but I will feel that the erosion of family will come to Africa. That's why we want you to understand this. Yeah. Could, could you describe some of the measures contained in the anti-homosexuality bill? Yeah, we call it a draconian bill because it goes to the extent of even penalizing somebody for not reporting uh, somebody he knew to be LGBT. For instance, me being a counselor, if I didn't report on someone whom I knew to be LGBT, that bill could penalize me. I'd either be fined, even be imprisoned. And if one was convicted as a, as a LGBT, you could be imprisoned, so for seven years, uh, uh, for life, life imprisonment. And in some cases, it could be sentenced to death, a capital punishment for being those people what they are. Not because they are really, for me, they have not done any crime. But when you criminalize such a thing, you can pass such a bill, which is draconian.